morning, everybody. Let's try one more time. Good morning, everybody. You all doing well today? Some of you are doing well. I want to say good morning to the folks that are watching us online. Gene Kincannon's with us and the McKee family and the Brantley family and many others. Um, we're just glad that you're here. Hey, if you're online with us right now, especially if you're on Facebook, share that link with somebody. We're just glad you're here joining with us and, and excited about what God may have for us today. So how was, how was everybody's Thanksgiving? All right, Thanksgiving, good Thanksgiving. You know, uh, typically the uh, typical response that I've been getting when I've asked people how their Thanksgiving has been, it's been something like this. It's been Thanksgiving was good, but it was just different, right? It was just a different kind of Thanksgiving this year. And, and let's just face it, our world is different today than it was this time last year. We're just living in a, in a different kind of world. I mean, it seems like everything is kind of turned upside down. It's just, just kind of crazy. And in fact, as we get ready for Christmas, this could be the strangest Christmas that, that you and I have ever experienced together. But I want to tell you, it is not the strangest Christmas ever. In fact, I believe the strangest Christmas was probably the very first Christmas. And you want to talk about an upside down world. I mean, that world was crazy. In fact, if you read the Christmas story, you'll realize just how crazy it is and how upside down everything was. I mean, think about the Christmas story. I mean, everything's upside down. I mean, a priest loses his voice. A virgin has a baby. Shepherds get to share good news. They don't ever get to share good news. A star points to a manger, and a king is born to paupers in a barn. I mean, none of that's the way things should be. All of that is the world turned upside down. And right in the middle of that upside-down world some 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into that world where where injustice and scarcity and fear and worry ruled. God sent his son into that world to begin the process of bringing things right, of making things right again. And 2,000 years later, here we are celebrating that event and knowing that our world is still upside down and that our world, that there is still injustices and that there's still worry and there's, there's still scarcity and racism and poverty. And there's still a God who is working in you and me to put things right again. And you see, for these next four weeks, these next four Sundays of Advent, um, we're going to be looking at the Christmas story about how God took the the things that were happening in the upside-down world 2,000 years ago and how he was working then. And our challenge is going to be to ask ourselves, how is God working today, just as he was working back then? And maybe to step back and see, once again, with fresh eyes, the working of God. And to be filled with hope, knowing that God is moving us ahead and is creating us anew. You see, I'm a, I, my concern is, is that for many of us, we're just ready to get to Christmas because we want to get to New Year's and we want to stop writing 2020 and we want it to be 2021. Yes? Yeah. But let's not do that. Let's take some time this Advent season, these next four weeks, to really look into God's Word and think about how God is at work even in this upside-down world, even within all the challenges that we have, even with a leaky roof over there that's really drawing my attention right now, but I'm going to try to stay focused. And if you're you're with us online, you can't see it, but our roof is in the process of being repaired, and and we've got rain, and so we got buckets inside, and that's not new on Orange Beach uh, to Orange Beach. That's what's been happening all around us. Well, let's get started today. Let's jump in and begin with the first Christmas story and see how upside down it is. Did you realize that the first part of Christmas, the first Christmas story in the New Testament, begins with a priest named Zechariah, and he is a priest who will eventually lose his voice. Now, question for you. What do you call a priest or a preacher who loses his voice? If you didn't hear uh, Mark, my good friend, he said, what do you call a preacher who loses his voice? He said unemployed. Um, 
I was expecting somebody to say a blessing or a gift, right? Uh, that could happen too. The first Christmas story actually starts as we meet a priest, an elderly priest named Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. And their world is going to be turned upside down. So let's look at the scripture today. Uh, Luke chapter 1, we'll begin reading and verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Now, just to help you understand what's going on here, what's a priestly division? Well, in Zechariah's day, there were 24 divisions of priests who served in the temple. So there's 24 divisions of priests. Each division would serve two weeks out of the year. So that's kind of how they divided up who was serving actually in the temple by division. Zechariah happened to belong to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So she was a descendant of the priestly family as well. Remember, Moses' brother was Aaron, and Aaron was the first high priest to Yahweh in the wilderness. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's command and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. Now, why in the world is that in the scripture? Why do we know that Elizabeth is barren and can't conceive? Well, you see, back in this day, in Zechariah and Elizabeth's day, if you were not able to conceive a child you were seen as being cursed by God. You must have surely done something wrong that God is not allowing you to have the blessing of a child. And so in this day, Zechariah and Elizabeth, where, where they lived, they were looked down upon. And you just imagine, you just imagine how many times people had talked about them. Because they were priests and they were part of a, a priestly family, both of them. And yet, and yet they... We're not blessed with a child. And you can just hear the whispers from the other priests and from the community. What's wrong with Zechariah and Elizabeth? Man, they're not all they're, they're cracked up to be. There's something going on there. And the whispers continue. It makes you wonder how many times Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed and asked God for the blessing of a child. How many years had they sought God and said, God, if you would just bless us with a child, and yet, that prayer, for years, went unanswered. Until one day, something incredible happens to Zechariah. We continue reading. Once, when Zechariah's division, verse 8, was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. Now, what just happened here? Well, what just happened here is Zechariah just won the priesthood lottery. Now, we don't kind of get that because we're living in a different day. So let me explain what was going on here. In the temple, in the temple of the Lord, there was a place that was called the Holy of Holies. It was the, the most sacred part of the temple. And in that most sacred part of the temple, they housed the Ark of the Covenant. Now, again, for those of you who have not been around church or maybe, maybe have forgotten a little bit, the Ark of the Covenant is that special chest. It's a special box, if you will. Um, some of you remember Indiana Jones, right? Indiana Jones, Temple, Ark of the Covenant, right? So this is for the Jewish people. This was the, the symbol of God. God said that he would dwell there above the Ark of the Covenant. And Moses is the one who he, he said, build this Ark and it would represent my presence in the midst of the people and they would know that this, that I dwell among them. And it was that Ark of the Covenant that they put into the center, into this place called the Holy of Holies in the temple. And once a year, only once a year, the high priest would go in and offer a sacrifice to the Lord into that most holy of holy places. Now, again, the high priest served basically for, for their lifetime. So, so it was very, very rare to become the high priest. But outside of the Holy of Holies, there was another place in the temple called the Holy Place. And this is a place where every day a priest chosen by lot. Now, what does that mean? Well, they actually kind of threw dice. See, they, it was called the Urium and Thurium. And, and they believed that God would speak through this method. And he would let 
the people know and he would let the priests know who he wanted to serve him that day. And it just so happened that that day Zechariah was chosen to go into this holy place, not the holy of holies, but the next layer, the holy place, and burn incense before the Lord. Now how rare was this? Well, think about this. Each division of priests had at least a thousand priests in it. Now, I'm sorry it's Sunday, but I'm going to ask you to do math, okay? So you've got a thousand priests, and they've got 14 days to serve. What's the chance that you're going to get selected to serve one of those days? Well, let me help you out. It's a 1.4% chance. That's it. 1.4% chance that you are going to be selected to go into this holy place and represent the people before God and then come out and represent God to the people. It was the highlight. It was the absolute highlight of any priest's career who would not become high priest to get to go in and burn incense in this holy place. And Zechariah was chosen. And so you, Again, now remember, this is the guy that everybody else talked about. They whispered about him because he didn't have any children. And so they said, can you believe Zechariah was chosen? What is God up to? What is God doing? So Zechariah gets to go into this holy place. And when the time came for the burning of the incense, all the people assembled outside in the temple area and watched as Zechariah went in to meet with the Lord. Zechariah goes into this most holy place. And then when Zechariah saw him, saw who? He was startled and gripped with fear. Saw an angel standing there by the altar when he was burning the incense. The angel said to him, Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Why? Because your prayer has been heard. Now, put yourself in Zechariah's place. You're in this holy place. You're standing before God. You're burning incense. All of a sudden, there's an angel, and the angel says, your prayer has been heard. And you're going, what, what, what prayer, right? That your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. Now, you have to realize that Zechariah is probably right around 60 years old, and his wife is probably about the same age. Zechariah probably hasn't prayed that prayer in probably 10 or 15 years, don't you think? Zechariah has probably forgotten all about that prayer. And he's fumbling around going, my prayer's been answered. What prayer, what prayer, what prayer, what prayer, what prayer? And God says, I remember you. And you know, maybe for you today, this is the message you need to hear, is that God hasn't forgotten your prayers. Maybe you've even stopped praying them, but, but what you need to know is that God has not stopped listening. And what you've asked, what you've prayed, what you've sought before the Lord, He still remembers that. He still knows your heart. And He still longs to bring you life and to bring you joy. Zechariah, God remembers your prayers. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never take in wine or other fermented drink. He's going to be special. It's a Nazarite vow that he's going to make before the Lord. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. And he will bring many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, when Zechariah hears this, something clicks in him. Now, again, you and I, it's like, eh, okay, that's nice. That sounds good. Who's Elijah? Well, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet of God. And what's significant about this is that the people of Israel have been praying for centuries, centuries, centuries for the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who would come and rescue Israel, would, would bring the nation of Israel back into prominence and would bring them back into favor with the Lord their God fully and finally. And so they have been praying for the Messiah. And the prophecy said that before the Messiah would come, Elijah would return. So when Zechariah hears this, that my son is coming in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, that sets off alarm bells in him. 
Because he's a priest. He knows the scripture. He knows the promises. And he's thinking, my son is going to be what's called the forerunner or the person who comes and who prepares the way for the Messiah to come. For God's Savior to come and to save us. And so the angel goes on and he says that your son is going to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this this is huge. This is huge. Zechariah has not only won the priesthood lottery in that he got to go into this holy place and burn incense, but now he has won the parent lottery. And and many of you know the story. Many of you know that his son is John the Baptist. and, 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 And he is just like, man, this is too good to be true. And you know what happens when something is too good to be true? Yeah, you normally blow it just like Zechariah is about to blow it, right? So look what Zechariah says to the angel. Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? I'm old. I'm an old man. And my wife is well along in years. Now again, just reading this, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But let's not forget who Zechariah is. Zechariah is a priest. His life is, is revolved around studying the scripture, knowing the prophecies, knowing the Old Testament, knowing how God has worked in the past, because as we've been reminded today, how God works in the past is how he'll work in the future. His promises remain. He is consistent. He is faithful. He is true. And the people of Israel, how did these people start? Well, they started with a guy named Abraham, remember? And Abraham was 100 years old, and his wife Sarah was 90 years old, and God came to them with a promise and said, you're going to have a child, and that child will begin the nation of Israel. And the child they had when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 was a child named Isaac. And Isaac would grow up and have children of his own. And one of his children would be named Jacob, who would later be renamed Israel. That's how this whole thing started. That's how this whole people started, was with the story of a miraculous birth from an aged couple. And if God did it back then, Zechariah, don't you think God could do it now? What's the matter with you, Zechariah? Where's your faith? And so the angel says this, I am Gabriel. How can you be sure of this? I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now, let me give you a little hint here. Okay, this is free today. If you are ever in the presence of an angel and the angel declares their name and their position in the hierarchy of heaven, it's not a good thing, right? You're in trouble. The angel goes on and says to Zechariah, and now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, until the day the child is born. And actually, it's the day the child is named. You will not speak in... If you'll read that story, you'll find, if you'll get to verse 62, that he was also not able to hear. You will not speak and you will not be able to hear because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And so my question to you is, what good is a priest without a voice? What good is a priest who can't share the message? Zechariah, he comes out of the temple, and he could not speak to the people. He was supposed to come out and dismiss the people, give the benediction, finish what he, what he had started, but he couldn't speak. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he, he kept making signs to them, but remained un, unable to speak. I read verses like that, and my fifth grade brain comes out, and I think what kind of signs he was making to the people, right? Flapping his arms, angel, angel, chicken, no angel. (laughs) Um, Now, here's my question. What good is it to have a message from God when you can't share it? What good is a God who is silent? And see, here's the truth, guys. God had been silent to the nation of Israel for over 400 years. 
It had been 400 years since the last prophet had spoken, that God had spoke to a prophet who spoke to the people a message from God. That last prophet was a guy named Malachi. In fact, that's the last book in the Old Testament. And it's 400 years between Malachi and what's happening here in Luke chapter 1. 400 years. And finally, and finally, and finally, God breaks through the silence. God breaks through the silence. And Zechariah has a message from God. God hasn't forgotten this. God is sending the forerunner. He is sending one. My son is going to be born in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then the Messiah is going to come. What a great message for the people. And now it's going to be at least nine to ten more months before you can even speak a word of it. Zechariah. So what do you do when God is silent? What do you do when God is silent and, and the world is turning upside down and you're looking for answers, you're looking for hope, you're looking for direction, you're looking to make sense of what's going on and it just seems like God is silent. Well, welcome, my friend, to 2020. Right? I was listening to a podcast the other day while I was out, uh, out running and it's interesting, uh, the podcast was actually recorded on the Monday after Easter this year. Now, some of you remember that Easter this year was on April 12th, so this is April 13th that this podcast was recorded, and it was all about having a virtual Easter, because you remember, we were not meeting publicly at that time at all. We were all uh, meeting online. And these pastors from some rather large churches out in California were all just talking about, wow, how great Easter was. Yes, it was different. Yes, it was strange. But we got to reach thousands and thousands of more people because we were able to be online with them. But you know what? I mean, it was the same kind of ratio for us. We, we reached hundreds and hundreds of more people because we were able to use the medium of, of the Internet to reach out with the good news of Christ on Easter Sunday. And so, so all these pastors, there was about three of them, were all talking about how great that was for them. And then one of them said, she said, you know, but I just can't wait to get back into worship again when we can, we can gather back in. She said, I think it'll be a couple more weeks. And she said, I just can't wait. And she goes, and then we could get all of our masks off. And she laughs and she goes, can you imagine being in church worshiping with masks on? That's eight months ago. By the way, thank you for coming in with your mask on, right? I mean, God, what's going on? Where are you, God? God, I've prayed for my children for years. God, I've prayed for my spouse. God, I pray for our finances. Lord, what about our health? God, I've prayed that you would just bring a friend into my life. I just need a friend, God. Just somebody I can, I can talk to. And you wonder, what's going on when God is silent or seems silent? And we forget, guys, we forget that the first Christmas begins with silence. Silent night, holy night, and nothing is calm or bright because our world is turned upside down. So the question is, what does God's silence mean? What does it mean? Well, well, here's some things that it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God's absent, right? Just because God is silent does not mean that he's absent. And just because God is silent, it doesn't mean that God's not active, that God's not at work, that God's not doing things, that God's not making things happen behind the scenes. See, here's what God's silence means. Well, I don't know what it means. I don't. God's silence doesn't mean that he's not there, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't care. And I'm like many of you. Sometimes I just wish I could hear him. But sometimes when God is silent, what I have discovered is, is he wants us to listen to the silence. Remember we spoke earlier about an Old Testament prophet named Elijah? 
Elijah is an incredible prophet of God. You'll find a story in First and Second Kings. And by the way, if you're like Carrie Ann and I, and you've got all these subscriptions to different television packages and, and uh, um, YouTube TV and Netflix and Prime and all that good stuff, and you still find what on TV? What? Nothing to watch, right? And once the football games are over, there's nothing to watch on TV, right? Um, go and read about the prophet Elijah. I mean, you talk about a story. You talk about incredible. This guy is an incredible prophet of God. And he has incredible victories from God. And he's coming off of just one incredible victory where he is defeated single-handedly by the power of God, 350 prophets of Baal, which is the foreign God, and actually had them all slaughtered. Yes, it's a crazy, incredible story. You need to read it. Um, First Kings. But Elijah also suffered with depression. He was real. And so Elijah has this great victory, and he has defeated 350 prophets of Baal, and then all of a sudden... Queen Jezebel, and yes, that's the Jezebel why you didn't name your daughter or your dog or even your cat Jezebel, right? That's, that's her, right? She says, I will have your head, Elijah, for this. I'm going to take you out. And so Elijah runs. He's just tired. And he runs out into the wilderness. And here's what happens. He gets out into the wilderness and he, the Lord says to him, go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle whisper. Now that, that term gentle whisper, it can also also be translated. I want to make sure I get this right. It can also be translated, the sound of gentle stillness. And when Elijah heard the sound of gentle stillness, he knew it was God. And the Bible says when he heard it, he pulled the cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave just before God. What do you do when when God seems silent? Well, maybe Maybe what what God is wanting you to do is just come and stand before him and listen to the gentle stillness. And in that, just maybe you'll be able to see God at work. I wonder what what Zechariah did over those next nine, ten months as he and Elizabeth watched and just waited for the signs of new birth growing in her womb. One month, two months, three months, and finally Elizabeth dare whisper the word, maybe, Zechariah, maybe I'm pregnant. It's interesting, the New Testament says that Elizabeth went into hiding for five months because she did not dare want to go and be in public and worry about, is this thing really happening or not? And then slowly and slowly, what happens? She begins to show. And the baby bump comes, and then it begins to get full grown. And it becomes obvious to everybody that Elizabeth is indeed pregnant. All the while, Zachariah's mouth is, is shut. He cannot say a word. But isn't it interesting, and I've always heard this, i never experienced it, thankfully, but that when you lose one sense, how another sense becomes more attuned? And Zechariah loses his sense of speech and his sense of hearing, but he sees more clearly. And in that silence, I believe God was growing Zechariah's faith. I mean, think about this for just a second. Think about this for just a second. What would have happened if Zechariah, the angel would have been there and Zechariah would have said, wow, cool, I get to be the the father of of the forerunner of the Messiah. That's awesome. Let's go tell the world. And so he out of the temple and he says what? You are not going to believe this. An angel just spoke to me and Elizabeth and I are going to have a child. God has promised us that. And all of you who talk behind my back, na 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 I'm right, you're wrong. And guess what? My son is not going to be any son. It's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Ha! Take that. I don't know if Zachariah would have said that. Jim Kinder would have said that. 
What did Zechariah say? When Zechariah finally got his voice back in Luke, you read it, Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 69, it's interesting what Zechariah says. He doesn't really say anything about himself or about his son. He says everything about the goodness of God. And I'm just wondering if Zechariah needed another nine or ten months of his faith to grow so that he could appropriately share the good news of what God was doing in his life. What is God doing when God is silent? I think God is growing our faith. I think God is growing us. And I think like Zechariah, he's calling us to open our eyes just a little wider and just see the glimpses of God at work. And at first, you may see nothing, but just give it a little time and in time and in time and in time, you'll begin to see God growing all around you and at work all around you. Paul reminds us of this in Romans. He says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Not of those who hear him, of those who love him and who have been called according to his purposes. So what do you do when God is silent? Well, you stop and you listen to the gentle stillness. You open your eyes to see him at work and you allow him to grow your faith. Been a challenging year. Lauren, thank you for your devotion. If you don't know Lauren's story, you need to know her story because it makes that devotion even more powerful. Thank you, Lauren, again. In the midst of the tragedy, in the midst of the storm, when God, when our whole world is turned upside down, and maybe we can't hear God like we want to, what's God doing? He is growing our faith as we trust in Him. My prayer for you this Advent season, this week, is that you will take time to be still and listen to the gentle stillness and ask yourself the question, God, how have you been growing my faith? And how can I walk with you in that so that I can be the person that you want me to be, the person that you created me to be? Let's pray. God, thank you for this incredible reality that into the upside-down world, You brought life, and you spoke truth, and you spoke hope. God, as we are wrestling with our own upside-down crazy world here, we know you're at work putting us right. Help us, God, to be still, to see, and to have our faith grow as well. We pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said,